I'll have to do the overall introduction again as we're now recording uh, and this video will inform everyone who's registered for this how that's going to be made public. We will make the slides available to everyone in any case. So um, just uh, to, to probably to listen to the speakers in terms of their experience. Um, it can be very valuable as you move forward. So this webinar is through Interreg Europe. IT Sligo are our partners with the Northern Western Regional Assembly as an Irish partnership in that. Um, I'll explain a little bit more current um, and emerging policy on renewable electricity in particular and grid connections, uh, whereby it be rural communities to get involved um, in community generation. Um, but the, the res scheme in particular, um, so below 500 kilowatts is not as clear what you can do, what the options are. So we're, we're focusing today on the options from realistically above, above 50 kilowatts to 500 kilowatts. That's what we're focusing on today. So some background, I will give uh, an introduction. Well, this is the introduction. I will give an overview of the AgroRes project itself. I'll then hand, there's a group water scheme in um, Roscommon and they have currently installed 50 kilowatts of solar PV, at, but they have planning permission to expand that to 150 kilowatts. The next speaker then will be Sinead Muller, uh, sorry, Sinead Brown. She's going to talk about the grid connection process. So there's a there's a process for this type of scale up to 500 kilowatts, and it uses the form this OT from Community Power. Um, and John will talk about the development of temporary wind farm and how that uh, spawns around the sale of electricity at this scale, um, either you know by setting up your own company like this or to Community Power direction and answer session. And that's going to be difficult, so we won't be doing live mic open mic session. As you go through the event, uh, if you have a question bubble in the in the toolbar of MS Teams, and if you put your question in there, Stevie and I will uh, select some of those questions for the panel to answer at the end. Um, OK, so just to discuss the AgroRes project, so this is a, a European project, the production and use of renewable energy in the agricultural and rural sector. It's not limited to, um, it's not limited to and while there is a lot of policy emerging in Ireland around the agricultural sector, it's mostly focused on decarbonisation and that's in there for opportunities for farmers and for rural communities in, in generation, um, either for their own use or for sale. The purpose of today's webinar as well is to, to raise some awareness around the specific aspect and to, uh, to encourage some more public dialogue and hope the AgroRes project has seven EU member states. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's an Irish partnership of IT Sligo and the Northern States, and you'll, you'll find more information on the website. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about AgroRes today, but the outputs from this will be uh, a large pack, part of the work is, is in the next stage, which is this regional self-assessment. So for Ireland, we'll have to do a squat force structures around renewable um, energy in, in the agriculture and rural sectors. And from that, we'll be developing an actual policy improvements. Uh, because it's, you know, I'm obviously talking a lot about policy here, and that is um, it, it, the, the whole idea of Interreg Europe is cooperation, sharing ideas, knowledge transfer. Uh, also, you will be able to see, um, you will be able to see more information on the links there, and you can see the links to the project. Byrne, he's a chairperson of the Old Cat Group Water Scheme, um, and he's going to outline the the, the scheme area. There's planning for a total of 150 kilowatts, and uh, so Martin's going to go through that. So I'll, I'll hand over to you, Martin. Okay. Right. Thanks, Mel. Um, Mel said, "My name is Martin Byrne. I'm chairman of CC as well. Uh, we're located in northeast Wisconsin, in a mostly rural area. We wouldn't have any." That's the extent of it. So uh, it's rural and it probably ticks the boxes that Mel was mentioning early, earlier about agricultural and 80 square kilometres. And within that, there are 600 connections to our scheme. Uh, 400 of those would be... Now, uh, we did this as a community. We, we, we delivered our planning permission and our... So and when you see the number 600 in there, in an 80 square kilometer area, it's six or only two or three houses within that 80 square kilometer that are not connected up to our group water scheme. But 
all but two or three of the population living within the 80 square kilometres have a stake and a vested interest, SEC does. Uh, and that applies whether it's in relation to water supply, water treatment, financial savings, or thankfully delivered in this PV project. Um, 450 cubic metres of water per day. Now we have to pump that from a source which is relatively low lying, etc. And we pump it over a distance of approximately 7.5 kilometres to a reservoir located 111, 150 cubic metres, uh, weighs 450 tonnes. And we have to get that 450 tonnes delivered, 7.5 kilometres. So it's, it's, uh, it's very high on energy consumption. The only other significant users of energy on our scheme would be the actual treatment process itself which relative to, to the pumping is minor and a bit of annual electricity bill is there for around eight thousand euro and at a bill of eight thousand euro especially when you have to try and keep costs down for the community uh, they just to go back to the 450 cubic meters is a day or uh, yeah sorry a day so we've managed to have the amount of water that we put. We did that through a process of um, identifying and improving any mains that might be defective or leaking, every connection. Now, the idea of that was that we would reduce waste as much as possible, and in so doing, a natural resource and things like that. Um, approximately four years ago, in 2000, and so course, we decided that we would try and uh, install a renewable energy project and at that time we ability of installing a small-scale wind turbine on our reservoir site um, the reservoir site seven and a half and eight meters per second uh, so it would have been a good location for a small-scale wind turbine um, and it worked to fund that ourselves at the time so we applied to the department of the environment who oversee the uh, group water scheme element of the funding they had and uh, we weren't successful and looking back on it it was a blessing we would have been depending on a good refit tariff uh, given that most of our electricity is consumed at our treatment phase connection and everything uh, we wouldn't have been using much of the electricity generated at all so we didn't get the funding at that stage um, just go on now. So, no, it's okay, no, that's grand. Um, so, the slide you see in front of you there now has a shaded lilac to my eyes. Anyhow, some people might disagree, but uh, that's an area and it surrounds, you'll see the, the, the light blue shade in the middle. That's our actual source, and the few buildings shown are that was purchased. Uh, with the main intention at the time that we would protect the area of ground around our source uh, from agri uh, and when we had it bought sorry Martin, somebody is taking control here uh, second okay just going to go back to the slide Grand. you could do the slides so. we had that area of ground bought and it it is just over uh, half a hectare um we realized that pv installation it was beside where we use the majority of our eight thousand euro a year at site we were adjacent to a main road facing south the south the site itself faces weren't looking in anybody's back garden the nearest houses houses that could actually see any um, and and it was obvious to us at that stage that inadvertently or by accident she project on now for the last 20 years veolia water have been treating our water for us under country fairly large international corporation is their renewable energy side of things so we approached veolia they were very very happy to get involved in try and project and um, it would 
as they were as far as they were concerned and as far as we were concerned be the first such a for a uh, group water scheme such as this so we drew up uh, plans initially for a 50 kilowatt and at the same time we had applied to SEAI for a grant uh, to have been able to afford it otherwise uh, and again from SEAI's side of things we were very well received and we were, in, we were given uh, Cormac Walsh from Energy Co-ops as our mentor. So and that seemed a bit daunting. Looking back, it wasn't that bad, but that's how you approach things at the time. So Cormac helped us. After that, SEAI uh, facilitators, facilitated us with the um, served uh, a company in Castlebury County, Wisconsin, that specializes in uh, renewable energy and renewable energy projects between ourselves and pat and veolia uh, we put together the outline of the and it was a question then of having to go to um, planning the first thought that and now again that was wishful thinking uh, because the size of what we were doing in hindsight there was no way it was going to be exempted some of them are there. Some of the uh, sizes for exemption are given there on the slide. Um, but we were elite as a community group, whether or not we would be exempt. Uh, so we decided the best thing to do was to ring the planner in those common county we needed. And the advice was, lads, you go for planning permission, the same as anybody else would. Uh, you're not exempted. So we were, we were getting on with it at that stage. Um, in getting on with it, uh, and probably the advice for any other scheme. The major consideration is what it says in your county development plan. Now, the Roscommon County Development Plan, and I think it's the same with development plan. Uh, so we studied that fairly well. Uh, within that plan, there's a specific, uh, anybody that would read that would see that the powers that be want to try and see community energy and um, i just read a bit from the County Development Plan itself. It says, Chapter 4 of the plan provides a broad discussion. Uh, this renewable energy strategy provides the framework for the development of renewable energy throughout the county and is incorporates policies and objectives. Uh, the renewable energy strategy itself spe says, specifically, energy developments throughout country as common are generally encouraged, providing they are in accordance with the principles of proper planning and sustainability. If we complied with the requirements of good planning and development, that we would have a fair chance of getting in the county development plan that we picked up on, and I'd say most people are aware of it. And that was a section pre planning process available to potential developers of renewable energy developments in the county should be availed of. Proposals will be assessed as information sourcing from the council's GIS uh, database will be undertaken. So we did, we attacked that from two fronts. In February 2019, we approached the office of the CE to outline what we were proposing. Now, we presented that as as the fact that it was an, a novel proposal. manager aware of it. Of course, at the back of it all,
I grant we had been allocated, uh, the work had to be completed by the end of October 2019. Now, that meant that any objection that would hold up the planning application would rule us out for the grant. So you can imagine we were pretty worried at that stage. As it happened, there were no objections, there were no submissions, and the planning permission was granted on the 10th of September with no onerous conditions. The, probably the, the most significant condition was that if at any time the plant wasn't being used for more than 12 months, we would have to go back to the county council. And at that stage, I'd say they'd be saying to us either uh, take it apart and get rid of it or um, put it back into action. Our uh, permission was for 150 kilowatt, as I say, and it was granted as a five-year permission, meaning that within the five years, we're supposed to deliver on 150 kilowatts or else, strictly speaking, our application or our permission isn't valid. Um, the, we would probably have the option of going back in for a reduced uh, scale if we don't deliver the 150. Um, so the installation commenced in October 19, and we have an installed capacity of 50.49 kilowatts. Uh, the area covered by the installation is 290 square meters, and our annual generation is projected to be almost 44,000 kilowatt hours. Uh, and that in total would result in approximately 26,000 kilos of carbon emissions being saved per annum uh, from what we're doing. Um, it's a 30 year permission. And the, as I said, the only uh, possibly significant uh, condition that was put on it was that there was a, uh, we had to send in a plan for restoration of the site uh, post anything being removed from it. So, um, in a nutshell, our experience of actually applying for planning permission, uh, it was totally painless. Uh, obviously, the community took on board uh, what we were doing. Uh, they had a stake in it themselves. We had four years previously at an AGM in 2016 given notice that we might be doing something like this, albeit at that stage we had uh, indicated it might be a wind turbine. I'd say the community were happier to see a solar uh, installation go in just by virtue of the fact that uh, it was going to be less obtrusive. Now, we were also fortunate with the site that we had in that um, it didn't impact on uh, many people locally at all. Um, so that was the, the planning permission applied for, and we have, as I say, installed 50 kilowatt. The, the next hundred that we have permission for is is a question mark at the minute. It's not that we don't want to do it, uh, but we won't be doing it unless we get a return on our dollar. So we won't. Um, so, the yeah, that's 100 percent now. Um, so uh, looking at our experience on the uh, project that we delivered, uh, there's a few important is it you important, um... Yeah, so I, I'll just go through uh, the next couple of slides. So the, the, the first installation has been operation since December, um, since December 2019, and the only been tracking the, the, the results of that. Um, Mel, there's a bit of an echo there, maybe if yeah, Martin mutes his Sorry, I, 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 yeah, put you on mute, that's fine. Okay, so what you can see here is, is the, the predicted production um, and the, the actual production. Solar is a variable supply, but it's it's quite predictable. So you can see that, that the actual production here reasonably matches the, the predicted profile. Obviously, you get more in the summer uh, than you do in the winter. May tends to be the, the, the highest production month uh, for solar in Ireland. So <clears throat> there's quite a lot of production here so far, and it's it matches, as I said, what's predicted. The, 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 the result that we're trying to achieve, or that, that Polcat are trying to achieve, is that they utilize all of that. As Martin said, right now, anything that is spilled back to the grid, they don't get any revenue for. So it's not worth anything for them, even though it has cost them to put the, uh, the capacity in. 
Um, so th that's, that leads me on to the next slide. And what you see here is the blue line is the is sort of a daily production. You can see the times there. This is over sort of four, four or five days, um, I think in June. Um, so that's being tracked. The orange line then, as you can see, you get you get quite a standard line. That's when the demand is there. That's when they switch these pumps on to pump to the header tank. So the orange line, um, if the blue line exceeds the orange line, that, that energy is lost to the grid at the moment. So we're trying, we're trying to look at ways uh, to improve on that. And it might, you know, it might involve rescheduling some of the pumping, but obviously subject, like this is the Veolia's call, it, it's subject to the water treatment process being the priority. So that that's where we're, you know, ideally you're optimizing balance, um, uh, the balances of demand and supply. Um, water projects like this tend to suit variable supply because there's an inherent amount of storage in there anyway. A header tank in itself is a storage system. It's, it's you know, it's, a, it's essentially a battery. Um, so there are maybe even options to uh, increase storage, but that's that's still under analysis. So that's and that's why, um, depending on what can be done with any additional capacity that's installed, will will inform the decision as to whether the extra hundred kilowatts are installed at full cash. So it's all a work in progress. Uh, I'd like to thank you, Martin. Um, sorry, Martin. Yes. Just going on one or two again. If yeah. Just so, for a second. Okay. Okay. Um, thanks, Mel. Yeah, the the water storage we have is two days storage. So if we can tweak how we use that reservoir, we effectively have a battery. And and as Mel said, that's a work in progress at the minute. Now, just looking at our experience, there were there were some key things that we felt helped us in getting to where we are. The first thing is we're an existing community group uh, with a track record of deliberate and for the community. And to that extent, uh, there's a certain amount of trust built up between the committee and the community. Uh, we did give early notification to the wider community of something like this happening. And we, we felt that basically we were we had people well primed for when something uh, would kick off then. There was a certain amount of financial gain for all in it that anything that uh, reduced costs for the scheme uh, meant that in the longer term the price of water for the consumers was going to be uh, reduced as well what we went at 100 with at 150 kilowatt hours uh, that is a relatively small scale uh, so as such that wasn't going to impact too much on the community uh, we we did have a good location, as I explained. Uh, following the decision to go ahead, we did carry out a targeted consultation with the people we felt would be most impacted on in the immediate vicinity, uh, and tried to explain to them as best we could what was happening, uh, what the impacts would be, and that we would be going through all of the necessary steps on planning and preparation for it in that regard. Uh, the pre-planning consultation with the local authority is important. It's there for everyone. So go for it and get your planning application right. Absolutely vital. In, in our case, it was a, an absolute most because of the time deadlines were on. Um, it's also important to have good partners on the project. And, and again, we were fortunate in that we had Veolia, EcoSmart, SEAI, uh, Energy Cooperatives, and we also had the help of Clore in Fair Morris in uh, Delivering or sorry, in getting the grant. Um, the only final thing I would say is that when you look at the, the res program and the we'll say minimum cut off of 500 kilowatts going forward, we see that as a as a major obstacle. Uh, communities aren't flush with money. Community group like ours would would uh, well, we'd find it hard to. First of all, convince, convince the community that they should raise that kind of money and then maybe to raise that kind of money. So as far as the 500 kilowatt uh, figure or stop is concerned, uh, certainly we would be saying that should be looked at. And uh, again, in our own case, if we could go ahead with 100 kilowatts at the minute and get 
benefit for that. We have our planning permission and we'd be ready to go as it is. We have to wait and see. That's it from the Polcat end of things in a nutshell. Uh, it was a fairly long experience time-wise delivering it, but in the heel of the hunt, it was, uh, it was painless enough. Okay. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks, Martin. Um, back to me again just shortly. I'm going to introduce now another part of the process here is, is, is a grid connection. So even if you're not setting the electricity to help manage what you're, what you're um, generating, uh, a grid connection is the simplest way to do it. With a, with, a, with a renewable energy generator, if you're generating electricity and not using it, it has to go somewhere. So unless you have some kind of a dump load on site, um, the simplest thing is to put it back into the grid. Obviously, the, the challenge there that Mark spoke about is selling it, but the starting point is you need agreement from the grid owner, that's ESB Networks, to export power to the grid. So I'd invite uh, Sinead Brennan, if, if Sinead is available, or if not, hopefully Rory is there, uh, from Mullen Grid. Hi, Hi Mel. Mel. Rory, Rory, Rory. How you doing, Rory? Uh, uh, I'm getting, getting my echo. My echo. Uh, uh, unfortunately, unfortunately if she needs, she needs just her, her, whatever, whatever, whatever in her laptop, in her laptop she's not able to get online. Get online. Get, get in the around. Around. Sorry, I'm Sorry, getting, getting gits. Get, or, or getting, getting, uh, uh, myself, myself to the other people, people need to go and get stop that. Yeah, that's better. Uh, unfortunately, Sinead actually, she, was, she rang me there just before three o'clock, said her computer just completely calved on her. So basically, uh, I jumped in to uh, quickly talk with this section. Uh, basically, uh, so unfortunately, I don't have any slides. I'm actually um, doing Wexford from sunny southeast at the moment. Uh, but the, but I'm happy just to quickly go through the, you know, the connection offer process and completing this NC5 form, which is ESB's connection application. So uh, the, the first thing, there's the sort of two main questions you have to ask yourself at the start of the process in trying to you know, get your grid connection from ESB. One, you know, do I want to export from the site? I think the, the last presenter was discussing uh, you know, a project where most of the energy was used on site. So, uh, so in that case, that was really auto production. So it didn't really need to export from the site. Now, maybe to increase their the extra 100 kilowatts they will want to then ex uh, export from the site at times. Uh, so the first question is, do you want to export from your site? And the second question is, what uh, what maximum export capacity, many kilowatts will you be exporting from the site? Because depending on the answers to the, those two questions, that will depend which process uh, you go through with ESB. If you're, uh, there is a micro generation process, and that's really almost more aimed at sort of people doing this domestically uh, or, or in small scale where up to six kilowatt single phase or 11 kilowatt three phase, you can export through what ESB called your micro generation process. And that's an inform and fit process. And you can download that application form or your supplier, you know, uh, so I put some solar panels on my roof at home. So I would have went through the, uh, the inform and fit process, but it was actually the equipment supplier uh, the people who put in my solar panels actually did all that uh, paperwork. Uh, I just had to give my NPRN number to them. Uh, but that's that's for quite small scale generation. Uh, if you're above 11 kilowatts uh, and up to 500 kilowatts, there's something called the non-batch process. And if you're over 500 kilowatts, you would be in what's called the batch process. Now, they come out with a decision there in June where they have a new process for community projects between 500 kilowatts and five megawatts. Uh, and I'll maybe talk a wee bit about that in a minute, but for projects, maybe, you know, the category today, you're really going through what ESB categorizes as the non-batch process, you know, between 11 kilowatts and 500 kilowatts. Uh, now that 11 kilowatt limit has been reviewed at the moment uh, by the likes of the Department of Energy, the CRU and the ESB networks. And there's a possibility next year that might increase up to uh, 50 kilowatts. So there might be a new process for 11 to 50 kilowatts because the process, you know, above 11 kilowatts is probably too bureaucratic and cumbersome for a lot of people uh, to the point where I'm finding a lot of people are going for what's called the zero export process. So they're, they're not exporting anything to the grid. And in that case, there's a fairly simple process to go through 
where you inform ESB what generally you're connecting and as long as you're committing not to export uh, and you have a mechanism to make sure you don't export, it's fairly straightforward. So a lot of people doing sort of rooftop solar installations, you know, commercial scale, they're currently going through the zero export. So they're being designed into factories or businesses that would use, you know, all, all the energy on site. But if you really want to export, you have to go through this ESB non-batch process uh, between 11 and 500 kilowatts. And there's a number of rules around that. Uh, first thing is you have to actually have plan permission for the facility to do that. Uh, so if it's solar panels or a wind turbine or biogas, you actually have to have plan permission or it has to be exempted from plan permission. Uh, hopefully in the future, maybe the likes of rooftop solar will have more plan exemptions. Uh, but there's a, a part of the ESB form where you'll have to confirm that you have uh, a plan permission and have that signed by either a solicitor or uh, a planning consultant and accredited planning consultant. Uh, so, so before you can go into this offer process, you have to have plan permission. Uh, the so then there's an application fee to ESB networks. You complete the the it's called the NC5 form, and you can just find that by googling ESB networks NC5, and the form will jump out at you. And it's the long NC5 form is the one that has to be complete for the 11 to 500 kilowatt generators. And the application fees between 11 and 50 kilowatts is 778 euro plus VAT. And for 50 to 500 kilowatts is 1587 euro plus VAT. Uh, so you complete the application form and you know uh, you, you, you put in the application fee as well to ESP networks. And then they go and process the connection offer to uh, you know and come back and as part of processing the offer they look to see if the existing local network can cater that level of export onto the grid uh, now if there's no other generators on the system most local three phase networks could probably take up to 500 kilowatts where it gets a wee bit more complex is if you're in areas where there's already a lot of connected renewable generation you know whether it's small hydro or wind and there there may actually then be uh, substantial upgrades required to the system and as a generator you pay for whatever require, upgrades required to the system that could end up with uh, the project possibly being to the point where it's unviable if the if the upgrades are, are too expensive uh, but hopefully there is capacity in the local network for your project uh, see in terms of completing the application form the NC5 form here uh, there's a number of different sections to it, so it's quite a you know uh, it's quite a complex form in that you probably will need some support from uh, either your equipment supplier, uh, which is what I've seen for small scale generation, particularly in Northern Ireland where there's a lot of small scale generators connected. A lot of the equipment suppliers supported uh, you know uh, the people who were putting in these forms, or you can go to somebody like ourselves, Grid Consultants, and we can help you. But I'd say your first protocol is to see if the, uh, some equipment suppliers can support you in completing the form because you have to provide quite a lot of technical detail on the generator. Uh, so there's a number of sections you filled out a lot of electrical information. You have to provide what's called the single line diagram. So you have to show how your project's going to electrically connect in on the site. And you also have to provide maps of the uh, site location, including like a, a site boundary. Uh, so on sort of on, on page two of the application form, it's generally a lot of generic information, you know, the site, the applicant, and general details, in, uh, as well as what is the MEC, how many kilowatts are you applying for? You know, page three is requesting that you attach to the application form maps and single line diagrams uh, for, for the project. Uh, uh, and then in, in some of the later pages, like five and six, you have to provide technical detail of the generator. And say that's where you're going to need some sort of electrical support to complete that. Uh, page 11 is where you have to confirm that you have plan permission for the facility, including it's been stamped by a solicitor or planning consultant. And then on page 12, you have to again, confirm that you've landowner consent, again, uh, uh, that confirmed by a solicitor. So there's a fair bit of work in completing the NC5 form for these 11 to 500 kilowatt uh, projects. Uh, for export capacity. Uh, for the new community, and, and, and 
this current process, 11 to 500 kilowatts, you could apply today for it, assuming you've planned permission for the for the project. Uh, ESB will, at the moment, now they've only received a very small number of these applications in the last year. Uh, and, and I think partly it's a lot of people are going for the zero export approach at the moment. But the other aspect of it is that it can take ESB, in our experience anyway, six to 12 months to process those applications. So a lot of people aren't really wanting to wait around six to 12 months, uh, particularly if they're maybe getting some grant aid for their project, they actually have to go and get it built. So again, that's why people are going for the zero export approach, which would maybe have a more like a, a one to two month turnaround and getting the paperwork. Uh, ESB also have a number of a limit of uh, probably processing about 15 to 30 of these applications a year. Uh, say at the moment they're small numbers, but I would imagine if you know small renewables take off in Ireland, those numbers will grow very, very quickly and ESB and the regular are going to relook at that 15 to 30 project limit across the whole of Ireland. Like in Northern Ireland, NIE, whenever small scale we can build, you know, uh, you know, around 2010, 2015, they were probably processing uh, two or 300 applications a year from small scale renewables. So I would expect that ESB networks are going to scale themselves up to be able to do that uh, if, it, if it takes off in, in the Republic. Uh, they also will only process one of these applications per what they refer to as 100 Hankey nodes. So there's 100 Hankey substations dotted around all the main towns in Ireland. So for example, there'll be one in Sligo as an example. So any of, you know, whether Sligo town or the likes of Manor Hamilton will be fed from Sligo. So ESB will only process one application at a time to go into that Sligo node uh, because they would interact a bit with each other. Uh, and again, that could be, you could be very unlucky that somebody else has already been processed at your node. And as well as it taking six or 12 months for ESB to process your application, you might have to wait six or 12 months for somebody else's to be processed. And again, unfortunately, that's the cumbersome nature of the, the current grid process that's there. Uh, but all you really can do is get your application in and, 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 and you know, uh, f if you really need the export capacity. Uh, just to touch a small bit on the community uh, process, that's 500 kilowatts to five megawatts. And uh, maybe people today are, are less interested in that, but that's a new process starting in September. Uh, you now for this process, you don't actually need plan permission to apply. So you apply to ESB, uh, you pay a 2.2 thousand euro first stage payment, and they will actually give you an indicative or a connection method and cost for your project. Uh, they, uh, you then have two years to get plan permission for your project and then once you get planning they'll give you a connection offer if you're delayed in the planning process they'll have to relook at your connection method because things may have changed if, if it's beyond two years so there is does seem to be a, a fairly community friendly process being put in place for the uh, 500 to 5 megawatt uh, community site projects and uh, again there is a limitation initially of, of 15 of those projects per, per annum possibly higher up to 30 depending on how many of the non-GPA, the non-batch ones get processed uh, for the for the 11 to 500 kilo, kilowatt category. Uh, so I suppose that's sort of going through the process and application forms and apologies, say I, I only got thrown in here at the last minute to, to go through this and I didn't have any slides today. Uh, I'm sure Mel can circulate our contact details. Like I'm happy to take a call and, and you know, uh, next week and, and go through this on a more project specific basis if, if, if that's deemed useful. Yeah, thanks, Rory. Um, no, I, I appreciate there was some, we have some issues here on our own end. The, the, the whole thing broke down at one stage and we had to rejoin. Mm -hmm. uh, but th thanks for joining us. We will send out a copy of the NC5 form with a follow up email to all attendees in any case. Um, the grid connection is often the most confusing for people who, who don't do grid connections every day. Um, the point here is that there is a form that deals with the scale we're talking about today. So the 50 kilowatts to 500 kilowatts. And when you when you see the form, you will see the information that's required. It's not it's not that you would have to have to know all that information, um, but, you, but you have to find somebody who does know the information to fill the form in. And as Rory said, um, they're available. There are other um, agents out there available, but as Rory said, if you're dealing with a technology provider, whether it's the solar installer or a wind turbine installer, mm -hmm. they will very often have the expertise to fill in this form. It's, you know, that's part of their business. 
Um, so thanks again, Rory. Um, so we'll move on to the, the final speaker. Um, uh, so this is um, John Fogarty from Community Power. So uh, I'm going to be presenting or, or trying to move the slides along for John. John, are you there? Yes, Mel, I can hear you. Good stuff. So I'll I'll switch to your your slides now. Okay, I I think you're sort of running low on time anyway, so I might might skip through them. Um, uh, I think people will still be interested in in um, in uh, what you have to to show. So hopefully, you now what. Can I just ask what you're looking at at the moment? Uh, it's the, the very first page on the slide. Okay. Uh, has it moved on? Yeah, our story. Okay, good stuff. So, um, yeah, if you uh, if you want to start talking, I'll try and I'll try and follow on. Okay. Okay. So uh, I suppose um, most people are at this stage are, have heard of Temple Derry Wind Farm. Uh, it's a community-owned wind farm in North Tipperary. And uh, having got that completed in 2012, to which I might uh, inform everybody that Mel had an input. He was the engineer on site at the time in a different uh, uh, part of his life. So um, uh, having, having completed that, we had applied for um, a supply license. Uh, the original intention was that we would buy the, buy the power from our own generator and that uh, we would sell it to our own shareholders and the community locally. But uh, we were financing the, the, the wind farm at the time of the financial collapse. We, we, we timed it perfectly for the financial collapse. So the, we were just doing, ju doing due diligence with the, with the bank and that particular bank uh, decided to pull out of the Irish market altogether. Uh, so we had to start from scratch, but we eventually got it financed. But um, one of the restrictions that was put on us that was that we couldn't buy our own power because I suppose they were afraid if one company came under pressure, the the two companies would come under pressure. So uh, we had we ourselves had to enter into a, a power purchase agreement, 15 years long, uh, with one of the large utilities. So we're more than halfway through that now. So at the moment, we can buy electricity of everybody else in the country except ourselves. So that's the irony of that. Uh, but however, we carried on with the supply company. What we did was uh, we started buying um, uh, power from some small hydro generators around the country, most of whom were, were just spilling the, the electricity that they weren't using on site in, in, into the grid and weren't getting paid for it. So um, we we managed to to um, do up a PPA that w was suitable for them, and uh, we did a 15-year power purchase agreement with them, and uh, that all worked out very well. So uh, as a result of that, we learned how to how to um, trade in the electricity market uh, on the generation side. So. Um, uh, generation uh, was all important and and quite quite easy for us to trade. So we did that for that took us two or three years. So then we started to look at the supply side. So uh, we we were classified as a small supplier. So we could take on up to two hundred customers. Uh, so we we put our own houses on as as uh, customers initially. Uh, my own house was the the first one to go on and. Um, we 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 started to supply electricity. So, in that way, we learned how to trade on the supply supply side in in the electricity market. So, uh, the whole process, I suppose, took us four to five years while we were making sure that we were able to able to do what we were setting out to do and 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 trade at both sides of the market. Uh, and it has worked out very well. So, that we were getting support from some other communities around the country at that stage. Uh, and um, so we decided we would uh, upscale to become a large supplier and so that uh, bit by bit we would be able to, to connect with more and more communities around the country uh, and uh, encourage them to start generation projects. 
so that was our main uh, main goal that that uh, we would we would uh, have communities generating power in their own locality and and be, be that power being supplied to their own to their own sh people and their own shareholders so uh, so we said we we qualified as a large scale supplier last november uh, and that's a fairly exhaustive process because um, the rules and regulations and compliance uh, are very strict and stringent, and and uh, we were we were treated treated on the same basis as the large utilities uh, as ZSB and Airtricity and Energy and all the rest of them. Even though we had less than two hundred customers, uh, we were treated as if we had uh, half a million customers. So um, that was that was fairly challenging. So. Uh, we had to build an IT system then that would be able to interact with the electricity market, uh, and uh, uh, that was the expensive part of the of the situation. So we managed to do that, and uh, now we're sort of all systems go, and we're trying to encourage communities to join in with us, um, because uh, wh what we're proposing is that community power would become. Um, a utility that would be owned and governed by by communities around the country uh, and that each of those communities hopefully would at some stage start a generation project of their own uh, because um, having it a money making exercise changes the whole the whole uh, landscape uh, i can tell you straight out the big developers don't like us talking but we always make a point of telling people but we have two 4.6 me megawatt uh, turbines and they on average uh, generate 1.1 million every year uh, so you can see the benefit of a generation project in your locality especially in rural areas uh, and uh, so uh, we have been trying to encourage that concept ar around the country and um, we have been meeting a lot of obstacles, I must say. The, the, the big boys don't like us messing around in this pool. Uh, but um, we're, as more and more communities join us, we're, we're becoming more and more galvanized to make success of it. Uh, so um, wh wh where, where you're at now, uh, you're talking mainly about micro generation, but to us, uh, the, the community generation pot. Uh, and we spent nearly the last two years um, uh, negotiating with the CRU and and the department to include a community section in this res scheme, and um, it it was a long battle. And uh, thankfully, uh, the, for the first time ever, there's a community section in this renewable energy support scheme. So that's a huge breakthrough. And. Um, uh, now we there's still a, a lot of anomalies in it, as as you've, as, as Rory has pointed out, uh, and in, indeed Martin before him, um, that that that, that uh, restriction of six kilowatts and uh, eleven kilowatts was a joke, uh, and really, uh, to, as far as we were concerned, it was put into the system just to block people from from becoming prosumers and putting generation on their roofs and all the rest of it. Uh, I'm quite sure networks would have a different explanation, but um, so we have, as part of our negotiations in the last um, two years, um, we have invited down to Tipperary the the Climate Action Committee, and they've all come down. It's a cross-party committee, and uh, we showed them a good lot of projects uh, around the region. And we, when we were feeding them in the evening time. Uh, we pointed out all the obstacles that we had to face to get there. And um, so uh, I think it, it was it was it came as a surprise to the politicians in general because they'd been taking their their advice from from uh, department officials and civil servants who a lot of whom had never been outside the office. So um, uh, they really did become activated and they invited us back up to present to the Climate Action Committee, uh, uh, which we did uh, last October or November. We, we didn't realise that on the same day they'd, they'd invited the, the regulator to attend. So th this, the, the, um, they got us to present our, our, our scenario and to outline the problems we had and then it was all turned on to the regulator. And in fairness to him, um, 
he did promise uh, that he would come down and uh, talk to us uh, uh, as a result of the meeting and every all the the difficulties we pointed out to them, and uh, they did. The the regulator, the uh, the head regulator, and three or four of his senior officials came down to us, and we were invited back up to another meeting with them um, in the end of March. But because of COVID, it was put back. So. At least now we're in we're interacting with the regulator and the department on behalf of these uh, community projects so that's why we're very very interested in what you're doing here mel and i know you're operating just a, we're, to us uh, the community section is from five megawatts down but you're really talking from from 11 kilowatts up to up to 150 i suppose uh, but uh, we have been really hammering on uh, about that that 11 kilowatts, and they have assured us. I think that's going to almost certainly going to go to uh, 50 kilowatts, and then whether whether they introduce another another section between 50 and and 500, uh, I don't know. Uh, that might be helpful to the likes of of Martin and the project he's he's doing. But as a general rule for for communities, um, the, the new the, the the res auction itself, the first res auction, is in process at the moment. All the bids have been put in uh, at noon on Tuesday or before noon on Tuesday, and uh, so uh, we'll see how how uh, that community section has fared in that. Uh, there was a big suspicion that some of the developers were actually gaming, gaming the community section and, and sort of putting together bogus communities and, and false communities or whatever. Uh, so we, we don't know any. <laughs> we don't know. And, and once, once, once those stories start, they always get amplified. So we have no idea. But um, we are very adamant that we'll fight the corner uh, on this community section and uh, we would uh, dearly love any assistance we get from other communities like yourselves around the country. Um, as regards, uh, say what Martin is, is talking about, uh, the, the next stage of his project, uh, the 100 kilowatts, um, th that can be applied for now in September uh, to apply for, for the grid connection for that. And uh, he already has planning. So, um, it, it, it's. Uh, I, I'm not too sure about the cost in, in that particular section. Is it what did Rory say? Was it a 1500? I, I, I suppose to to apply for a grid connection. But I, I would I would suggest that they go ahead and do it. Uh, and uh, he has planning. Um, the the cost of solar panels themselves has have come down uh, dramatically. Even even in the last 12 months since they would have put up their 50 kilowatts. Uh, and uh, so overall, there's there's um, there's a, a, a sort of a just a, a positive uh, vibe going towards communities at the moment. And I think the new in minister for energy is very aware of the community aspect of all of this, uh, and we've certainly been using every opportunity we can to to outline it. So um, uh, community power to me should evolve into into your community power uh, into in, in, into a community power for all communities around the country we would like that uh, that they they get to the stage where uh, it is owned by communities around the, the country at the moment it's been temple Derry who's who's been name, mainly financing it and uh, as we scaled up and and did put the investment into the the new it system and that it, it's still losing money. So if any of you are uh, feeling like switching to your supplier at the moment, please take in community power as, as, as an option because we, we badly need the support. We just want to get it to a stage where, where it's breaking even. And then we can start inviting in maybe uh, more community ownership into it that we don't want to be inviting people into owning something that isn't making money. So, uh, but, uh, we we feel that you know we'll turn that corner maybe at the end of this year or certainly in the first quarter of next year and we're really heartened by the 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 the, um, the support we're getting from from communities around. So there's a number of those communities in this res auction. So we'll be we'll be watching for the results uh, and hoping that some of them come through it. Uh, and 
We're in the process of helping a number of communities to apply for Res 2. And if there's anybody listening in who may have a project that might qualify for that, we'd love to, to assist them. Uh, and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll help in every way possible because uh, it is, you know, in coming together, we have the strength and, and uh, uh, you, we need to be able to fight our corner in this space because the large scale developers don't don't like to see us piddling around. They're afraid the idea might actually take off. Um, if just to give you an example, if an outside developer were to leave 1.1 million in our in our um, in our parish uh, with a wind project, he'd build 33 turbines because he'd only believe in 33 or three and a half percent of the the output in the parish. Uh, and that's the difference. Imagine if there was just two to three turbines owned in every rural parish in the con country by the community, and that that money stayed in the locality. The first thing the developer does when he has them commissioned is he sells them on to, um, to, um, to a hedge fund or a pension fund abroad, uh, because the pension funds and hedge funds will only get involved when all the risk has gone out of it. So they, they they take the risk and then they sell them on at a large profit. So most of the turbines that you see turning around the country at the moment uh, in large numbers, uh, they're all owned by Canadian pension funds and German pension funds and hedge funds around the world. And it's just like we've been paying the Arabs uh, six billion a year for for oil. Uh, so now we're handing over our the natural resource of our, of our wind uh, energy uh, to to foreigners as well. P I mean, um, people just don't realise how lucrative this is, and 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 how how easy it is to do. And uh, people they get away with saying, "Oh, you can't raise the money. You can't get grid connection." We can do all of that. Uh, and the bigger the project is, the easier it is to actually develop. Uh, so, you know, if uh, Martin already has, has planning for 100 kilowatts, but, uh, you know, if I, if, I, if I were talking to him now and he was only starting to go in for planning, I'd tell him go in for, for a megawatt. Because uh, the, the grid, if he said mentioned a three-phase line. Uh, most three-phase line three phase lines around the country can actually take up to to a megawatt uh, without having to build a new line uh, so um this communities should be cashing in on all of that before the big developers do and and uh, uh, it it's not such a big deal financially uh, it, 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 the the department have said they'll put um uh, a scheme in place to help uh, with the initial costs uh, for res 2 uh, now, it mightn't be fully in place for RES2, but it'll probably come in place as RES2 pro progresses. And RES2 is starting in, in September. So we we would be hoping, what we've been asking for is that, say, they do something like they did in Scotland, where, where um, you can um, get a loan from the government to do your planning and do your grid connection and, and uh, do your lease. And if the project is successful, you pay that back over a period of years that the project will be able to pay it itself. And if you're unsuccessful, then the, the government write off write off the loan. Uh, and and that, that would take all the major risk out of it for, for your communities. So we, we feel that that's going to happen. And, and uh, that if, certainly as we grow in strength. So look at, um, I, I better not go on too much longer, but I just ask you all, if you can to switch to community power and to contact us if you have a project that we can help you with because that's what we're all doing we're all helping each other so thank you mel uh, thanks very much john um i might just put you on mute to avoid the fight feedback just a second uh so just bear with me a second Yeah, so thanks, John, for that. Um, there's a few comments in here in the in the in the in the chat section here from from satisfied customers of of, of uh, community power. They're currently buying buying the power from community power. So there's a couple of uh, endorsements there. In any case, um, so look, there's a lot to take in. I appreciate we've gone well over time. Uh, the, the reality in, in terms of questions is we haven't had a lot of questions come through. 
So I don't think we'll we'll get into a, a question section just yet unless something comes through while I'm blathering on for a minute or two. Um, so there's a lot of information to take in there. Uh, if you've joined this and uh, you're not, you haven't been planning a project, you haven't been looking at at um, a, a local uh, or, or your own renewable energy project just yet. The key things to take away is that there are processes at every scale. As John said, the larger the scale, generally, the, the, the more lucrative it is going to be, the, the better business case you will have for it. But there mm. are processes at the smaller scales. You'll have heard us talk about the micro generation levels and people talking about the 11 kilowatt limit. Hopefully that's going to change. But right now, below that limit, there's a very simple process to put in um, a, a renewable electricity generator. But really, it's only of any use if you're going to use, it's, it's only of any value to you if you're going to be the one using the electricity. It will save you the electricity you would otherwise buy from the grid. So that's up to the 11 kilowatts. When you move above that, and we go from sort of the 50 kilowatt range up to 500 100 kilowatts. They're the processes that we've been talking about mostly today. Um, and in that scale uh, is falls the uh, the, the polecat um, the polecat uh, project there, the solar PV at potentially 150 kilowatts, and room there to expand to to to, to even further to maybe to maybe 500 kilowatts. And it's in that space that we talked about today. There is a grid connection process. And there are some some energy suppliers who will buy that that electricity, subject to it being um, at a suitable price, at, at a proper market price. And then, if you move above the 500 kilowatts to the, the half megawatt and above, then you're into the renewable electricity support scheme, which is the more well-known policy instrument at the moment. That's the auction that John spoke about. That's that's currently the bids are going in uh, next week, um, and within that. Um, there is a section for community uh, generation, and it's 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 thanks to people like John that we're using the terms community and energy in the same sentence in Ireland. Um, so there's been a lot of work, and it's the pioneers like the people in Temuldaria and and Tipperary Energy Agency and Community Power who've uh, who you know smoothed the road uh, on that for for a number of years. Um, so we, I, I just see, is there any, is there any questions uh, that we could have a look at here? Oh, we've got another endorsement from 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 Aaron for Community Power. Very happy there. Um, well, yep. Yeah. Uh, sorry, Stevie here. There, there, there's a question there from uh, from Roisin about, um, and I'll add to it as well. Um, it's a question from Martin and Polcat, um, and the question that I have is. Um, how was the cost of the planning application covered? Did Veolia cover that for you? That's the first question. And the second question is there from, from Roisin. Um, she's asking about what was the cost of the PV project in Polcat. I'm not sure if you want to share that, Martin, but that's, that's the other question. There's no secrets. There's no secrets with us, Stevie. Um, we uh, paid for everything. Uh, the total project cost came to about 68,000 euro, and that included the planning. The um, site we didn't have to pay for because we already had funded that as part of our source protection scheme. So in or about 68,000 and take away 50% of that with the SEAI grant. Uh, now you don't actually get the 50% because some charges are stopped for and things like that. But we'll say we ended up paying approximately 40,000 euro for a 50 kilowatt installation. And you've seen some of the performance figures there to date. They've been on schedule. And we reckon we'll be paying for that installation in four to five years. And that's allowing for some kind of a sinking fund as well for uh, fixing the site at the end of the term. Hope that answers it. That does. Thanks, Martin. And then and then another question then for John. Um, sorry to be hogging it here. Um, John, you mentioned there that obviously we, we have this yeah, webinar sorry. today because there's a webinar yeah, on today yeah. because um, of the gap of that 11 kilowatt up to the 500 kilowatt. I, I think I heard you mention that 
there now might be potential for a 50 to um, 500 kilowatt bracket. Um, is that something we talked about at, at department level, do you know? Uh, very much so, yeah, because once we started to say, well, that, that 11 kilowatts is going to 50, well, then, uh, you know, that, that there, there's a new space in there. Uh, and uh, so I should imagine we'll have an announcement on that probably for RES2. Uh, so the applications for RES2 is, is kicking off uh, in September. So uh, certainly I, I should imagine that they're very aware that, that, that stuff needs to be done there. And, uh, you know, if, if, if you take um, the Greens being in power now at the moment and and the problems being experienced around rural Ireland, uh, you know, as regards um, uh, you know, almost being forced to cut back in production and all that sort of scare talk. Uh, the solutions have to be found for that. The, you can't uh, tell a farmer to to uh, cut back on his production unless you 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 provide an alternative income. And, and what we've been trying to do is say, well, there are alternative incomes. The the the, the if if a farmer had panels on the roofs of his sheds. It would be an alternative income if if he got proper proper support for putting them up there, and uh, if uh, an affordable method of anaerobic digestion was found, uh, that um, wouldn't be onerous on the farmer. In other words, that uh, he wouldn't have to face the wrath of of the EPA and and the planners and and all the rest of it. Um, a, a simple workable system, uh, you know, farmers in Germany have. Have, have, have at least three sources of income. Uh, that, you know, they have their, their normal farming practice, whatever they're in. They have the rooftop solar and they have anaerobic digestion and um, and probably a couple of others because uh, there's there's more streams going to evolve out of the, the, that uh, anaerobic digestion uh, situation. Now is, the, now is the best chance there is for that because they have to find solutions. They can't just say to farmers, um, get rid of half your cows uh, unless, they, unless they provide an, uh, an alternative income for them. So we, we feel that, that there's a, that it's a real opportunity here to, for, for communities to come together and, and to really, uh, you know, water protection is a huge thing. I mean, Ma Ma Martin, Martin has 600 members. Now, I, I'm, I, I was a founder member of our own group water scheme uh, in, in, our, in our area. And I know that most of the water pollution that's done in our area is done by our members. You know what I mean? So we have to we can't just say you have to stop a spreading story. We have to provide we have to provide a safe way of doing it. We have to give them the alternatives we have. So uh, there's a huge space beginning to evolve here. I said at a meeting last night that I'd love to be 30 years old again, because I think it is really a space that everybody can get in there and actually make a difference now. Uh, and I think there's a time out there to do it. OK. Thanks very much, John. Well, that tees you up nicely to say that the purpose of the Agro Res project is to affect change um, at a policy level. Yeah, um, that is, yeah, that's the purpose of the Agro Res. And I know from that, you know, OK, because of COVID, our engagement with the farming community has been stifled in the last six months. But uh, up until that point, and with the stakeholders that I am talking to, I know that farmers are sick of being blamed for climate change uh, without being told what the solution is. As John said there, there are solutions. There's room for dialogue here on, on, on our anaerobic digestion. I know that that brings up the discussion around displacing food for energy. But right now, as a country, we're exporting food and we're importing energy. So there is, there is space to try and balance that if it's going to be a benefit to the farmers. Um, and yeah, the, again, just for I suppose to, to, to recap on what we've been talking about today, if you if you if you haven't started to look at a, a renewable energy project and you join this today, you'll see there's so many what what appear to be separate parts to the process. Um, part of the recommendations, the policy recommendations from Agoriz, will be some alignment of that process. So we spoke about you know the, the planning exemptions of 50 meters squared on the roof. 25 meters squared on 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 a, on a ground mounted, those figures appear to be quite arbitrary. So 
hopefully we, we would be making a recommendation that those figures are aligned to something that makes sense. If it's aligned to um, the kind of solar array that reaches a certain grid connection capacity and a certain grid connection category, that would make more sense. Uh, and and it's it's elements like that that uh, that we'll be working on. Um, there's a lot of emerging policy around this, as John said, um, and and yeah, we'll we'll be taking it forward. So I'd like to thank the speakers today. So John Fogarty from Community Power, uh, we've Rory Mullen from Mullen Grid, um, and Martin Byrne from from Polcat, and thank uh, my colleague Stevie and Paul for helping out with this. I'd also like to thank SEAI for sending this out across the, the SEC network. The SEC network at the moment is, seems to be the, one of the better ways to, to reach out to a lot of people, a lot of people who are particularly interested in, the, in, this, uh, in, this, um, in this kind of uh, content. So thanks to everyone for joining us. Um, the recording of the event was somewhat interrupted because the whole event crashed at one stage. We will be making it public, we'll be making it available, but there is a slight gap in there, um, so apologies for that. We will be sending out the slides to all attendees by email. Okay, thank you all, and uh, we'll let you go with that. Thank you.